Claire from OPCA. Um, we're going to wait for just another minute or two while everyone calls. Hi, I don't know if anyone was trying to, to talk to us there, but the reception was really bad. I couldn't understand anything. Try again. Can you hear me now? This is Clara. Uh, it's really bad. There's, there's a lot of um, some kind of noise in the background. It sounds like you're a million miles away. Oh, all right. This one will work on that. Let's do the next. Right now. Hi, this is Claire again. Am I sounding any better now? Uh, no, it uh, sounds all distorted. I'll try calling back in and see if it's me. Are other folks on the line having trouble with this? Uh, yes, I hear a distortion too when you talk. Okay. You want to just just on this one? Or, yeah, okay. So we're going to use this. I'm still getting a lot of noise. I just called. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's uh, that's much better. Okay. Sorry about that. A tiny bit of audio difficulties, but we'll go ahead and get started now. So this is Claire Trenkays at OPCA, um, along with Craig. <laughs> and we are going to talk just a little bit today about the competition protocol. Um, so thank you all for dialing in today. We um, we will be recording this, so um, please note that because for folks that are not on the line, we will be sharing the recording with them later. Can you go to the next slide? Um, I just want to make sure you're familiar with our webinar platform. Um, if you are on a phone please mute your phone when you're not trying to talk so that we can attempt to not have background sounds. Um, 
we are going to leave you all unmuted from our end unless we do start to get some uh, hold music or typing or something and then we may mute um, but you are able to at any point type a question into the chat box as we go along and we will be monitoring that as we go um, and then again the webinar is going to be recorded so um, you know watch what you say on the phone if you don't want it to go down into history. <laughs> um, any quick questions about the platform or any difficulty hearing me before we get going? All right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and keep going. So, a uh, quick overview of today's call. Uh, we're just going to take a moment after this intro to find out who is on this call today. Uh, then uh, Craig and I will give a little bit of background on the competition protocol and why it exists. Then we're just going to dig right into the current protocol and then have a little Q&A about it. Um, in the webinar invitation, we did attach the actual protocol in there. It may be easier for you to look at the whole flow sheet um, on that, that Word document um, if you want to see the whole thing in its entirety. Um, and then we'll be going through piece by piece on the slides today. All right, so let's just do a little check in. Um, Let's find out who is on the phone. Let me actually try and um, do this in an organized manner so that you're not trying to talk over each other. Let's see. Looks like we have um, Amy Light on the line. Although I don't know if you have audio. Amy, are you on the line with us? All right. Um, then we also have, um, I believe it's Seth Whitmer on the line. Yes, Seth Whitmer. Yep. All right. Great. All right. And then Amy did say she is on the line, just doesn't have a mic. So she will communicate via typing if needed. Um, how about Janet Tribble? Yes, I'm here. I'm from South River in the Roseburg. Great, thanks for getting on the line. Um, and then it looks next we have Jill O'Neill. Jill, are you able to, oh, there we go, typing in. Hi, Jill. And Jill is from OHSU Richmond, if you need to capture that. Uh, and then it looks like Linda Maxson, she already typed a hello to us, so we know she's on the line. Hi, Linda. Next, we have Mark Harris. Yeah, uh, Multnomah County. Great. Thanks for calling in today. Uh, Michael Eves. Yep, this is Michael, also from Multnomah County. Oh, great. Welcome. Um, Richard Booth. Yeah, I'm here from Cisco Community Health Center. Hi, how are you doing today? Great. <laughs> Um, and then Rob Trachtenberg. Are you on the line, Rob? Jill, if he's with Jill, they may have no. Oh, all right. Also on, just without audio. All right, and I think that is it on the line for now. So thank you all for calling in. Um, and now you have a sense of who else is on the line. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and talk a little bit about this competition protocol. So um, the competition protocol is actually a board, an OPCA board developed uh, document. And it was created, well, when I came on to OPCA about seven years ago, there was a revision of it. But Craig tells me it's even older than that. What was the original? Early 2000, like 2000 three-ish, I think is uh -huh. 2004 is when we created it. We created it with members first because it impacted you all and then the board has approved it over the years uh, and updated as needed, but it's pretty much held the test of time. Like there hasn't yeah. been major or very, there's just been tweaking around the edges. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and there's just a little bit of tweaking to it um, at our most well, a recent board meeting, um, the November uh, 2017 board meeting. There's a few adjustments to it there, and so you have the most current version um, in the webinar invitation. Um, the reason it was created was to um, to address issues that might arise with overlapping service areas during times of health center expansion. Um, so that's sort of to address existing health centers. And then we also wanted an opportunity for any new start health centers, um, groups that would like to apply for new access points that have not been in FQHC in the past. We would like these folks to be able to have an opportunity to serve populations if there is demonstrated need. So a way for them to come into the model, even if there is potentially someone else in the service area that they're looking at serving. Um, and finally, this exists because we believe it's important oops, can you go back one? Uh, for us to have a good process so that we can all work together well as we um, work to expand our services. There's a lot of need out there and we just want to make sure that as we all work to serve and provide more services to the populations that we serve, that um, we are not somehow um, hurting each other's um, patient numbers or um, trying to go into areas where there is not enough demand for the services that we are thinking about providing. Um, so that's the basic background on the competition protocol. Before we go into the actual protocol itself, I'm wondering if there are any questions via the phone or the chat box. All right. Well, I will take your silence to me. No questions yet. Um, so this, the, the next few slides are really just the competition protocol itself um, in slide format. So if you have the document itself, you can also look at that. It makes the flow chart make a little more sense when it's all in one document. Um, so the title is the Protocol for Consideration of OPCA Clinic Members and Other Organizations Planning to Serve Overlapping Populations. And as I mentioned before, it was updated by our board in November of last year. So the time that this protocol might be used is defined here. So when organization A decides to investigate, um, either by contacting community members or elected officials, beginning those conversations, um, to investigate whether or not to expand their existing service area or expand into a new service area that overlaps with organization B service area, then the CEO or ED of organization B should be notified of the plan to do so via a written communication. And this protocol applies regardless of funding source sought for expansion. Um, so to clarify this, most of you are aware that when you apply for a new access point funding, there's a whole part of that application where you get points for your collaboration with other um, FQHCs and entities in your community. And so it's actually pretty clearly defined that you need to work with your fellow FQHCs and community at that point in time. What is less clear, I think, for some folks is that this also applies if you are going to expand services through maybe a dental or mental health expansion, or if you're planning to create a new access point but not necessarily through the grant funding process. So if your organization is deciding to move into a new community or um, build new sites in existing service areas, this does still apply. And so that's why we want to make sure folks are pretty aware of how this works. So one way that could be done is through a federal change in scope. So even though you're not getting a grant uh, from the federal government to do it, you're still doing you're still expanding services or you're locating a new site and in order to do that you've got to get federal approval and all this applies because they're going to ask the same questions mm -hmm. which is who's in the service area now is there um, and especially with this new administration we've heard this ramp up significantly i don't know if you're going to talk about that later but this it's you know if you think if you follow the bouncing ball this is the republican um congress which means they have a lot of um 
communities in rural areas, which means they want more access points in rural areas. So they're going to be looking at service area overlap when they decide how to distribute funds. All right, we can go to the next slide. Any um, questions about that first, what we just shared with you before we move on? Um, this, pro this competition protocol is really only about existing FQHCs. It is not about other entities. Now, good community development practices would say, yes, you also need to be talking with other entities and the communities you're looking to go into, um, but this protocol is specifically about the FQHC community. Well, let me answer that a little bit differently right. because it can go either way. So if there's an entity that comes into this service mm -hmm. area that is not an FQHC, gotcha. then we absolutely take them through the same process, yeah. right? Um, if there's other entities in the service area, like let's say Kaiser or somebody else, um, and there's a you know there's competition going on. You want that bigger conversation to happen to see because if you have two FQHCs in the same area, you're viability may not be strained, but you add all the other providers in the area, then it may paint a different picture. So I think you got to look at that bigger picture, mm -hmm. and I would encourage discussions in the local area yeah. with other providers. They, we're, they're just not members of ours, so we can't yeah, just really, yeah. force them through this process, but we can certainly help you all you know, set the table for a discussion like that. Um, any further questions about that? All right. Looks like we answered Linda's question. Um, so as we go into the protocol, so if organization A is um, trying to decide whether or not to enter organization B's service area, then um, either they decide no, they're not going to, and then this process ends, or yes, they do still want to go into this new service area, and then organization A and B um, define the populations of need and the existing capacity to meet that need. So when we're talking about um, our target populations for FQHCs, that is usually people at 200% of the federal poverty or below. Um, and then that generally encompasses Medicaid and uninsured individuals um, for the most part. So that is the, the population that we look at when we think about this. And to be clear, we're talking about, in these examples, organization A and B, but, you know, especially for those of you in the Portland uh, metro area, it may and be organization B, B, C, D, E, F, but we can help you define yeah. who, or um, figure out who to contact because we've got service areas for all of you. Yeah, thank you. Good yeah. reminder, because they're definitely, um, particularly in the Portland metro area, are almost seven um, FQHCs operating in the area. Well, for the most of the rest of the state, there's usually not more than two in one area. All right, can we go to the next? So as um, organization A and B are looking at needs and services, the first question is, is there agreement on the defined need and capacity? So the need being the types of services um, and the amount of services needed by the population you have defined, and the capacity being the amount of um, visits and services available from the FQHCs themselves. Um, so if there is not agreement, if, if that's a no, then um, you can work with OPCA to find an independent evaluator um, that is acceptable to both organizations um, and can help you work on this together in the timeline that you need to get this information. Often, if you're trying to apply for a new access point grant or something like that, you do have some limited timeline. Now, if there is agreement on the defined need and capacity, then you can move right on to discussing the sustainability for each of your organizations um, based on the need and capacity data. Um, the process to define the population's need and capacity should not take longer than 30 to 60 days. Um, unless there is another time frame agreed to by the organization. Um, I'll pause here and see if there are any questions via the phone or chat.
All right, well, then we can move to the next piece. So then the next question is, is there now agreement on sustainability um, after you have found an agreed upon definition of capacity? So if there is agreed upon sustainability, then you, you follow the yes arrow um, down to the next slide, so we're not going to go there quite yet. Um, if there is not agreement on sustainability, then OPCA will also help you find a facilitator that is acceptable to both clinics um, to discuss the more soft issues um, with each organization. And by soft issues, we mean more about the per perceived pros and cons of one organization establishing a clinic in or the other organization's service area. Uh, we hope that the issues talked about are going to be focused on operational and more objective issues and less on feelings. Um, and a time frame to complete this process will be developed by the facilitator and organizations to make sure that it does meet the needs and timelines for both organizations. So once this process is done, then you come back to the question, is there now agreement on the sustainability piece? And I will pause again to see if there's any questions before we move into this section. All right. Can you guys hear me? All right. uh, we can hear you all right. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the car, so I've, I've got it on mute mostly. But I wanted to ask, do we have a common definition of sustainable? Um, well, I mean, I think that's something that the yeah. two organizations talk about, you know, um, and that's where it gets into some of the, um, you know, softer issues, because I think to define what sustainable means in uh, every service area would be difficult. It depends on the size of the organization, um, you know, payer mix, all those other sort of things. So I think that's the conversation between the two um, executive directors of each of the organizations to, to flesh out. Um, and okay, can thanks. I just ask, who is this um, calling in on the line, just so we can capture your name? Sorry, this is Dave, Dave Edwards. Okay, thank you, Dave. We thought it was you, we just wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right, so um, then as we move on, if, if the answer is still no, that there is not agreement on the sustainability piece, then the facilitator that we found can complete a more in-depth analysis based on the questions the facilitator and organizations have. Um, so continuing, the facilitator would continue to work with the information and uh, parameters that the clinics have talked about in the, the first part of that discussion, and um, they'll sort of do their independent look into this data um, and think about sustainability in that way. And then if there is agreement at that point, after they do, after the facilitator does that, so following the yes arrow here to the right, um, if there is unmet need for both organizations in this market area, organization A proceeds with growth plans, if not, organization A does not proceed with growth plans. Um, and a third option is for the clinics to find a way to collaborate on an expansion project. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a yes or no. Sometimes it can be a, a partial yes with a collaboration as the way that this uh, develops. If there is still not agreement on the sustainability, um, then organization A and B might end up having to agree to disagree um, on, uh, on sustainability and then either proceed or not based on their own objectives. Go down to the next. Um, so then this comes to the, the very end. So um, at the end of either process, whether the clinics have agreed on how they're going to move forward or whether they've agreed to disagree, um, at the end, a report of the process and the conclusions will be developed by the facilitator and reviewed and edited by the organization um, to then be able to be reviewed by others if requested. Um, and then that takes us to the very end of the process. So, 
that is in a nutshell the process. Um, Craig, is there anything you have to add at this point? Um, I, I would say that what we want is the best solution is for you guys to work it out. So by the time it comes to us, it means there's some disagreement and we're happy to facilitate it, but that that's not the first step. The first yeah. step is for you guys to talk to each other and to work it out. And there were a lot of issues early on as expansion happened and we were in a lot of communities, which is why we developed this protocol so that we treat everybody the same way, right? Um, and so over time, you guys have gotten a lot better, actually, and, and we, that's why this thing hasn't been updated a lot because mm -hmm. you kind of get the, the way to work with each other and it, it's been going pretty smoothly. We've had a couple bumps recently, which is why we're bringing this back up um, and just make sure that everybody understands it because um, there's turnover at health centers and sometimes they may or may not be aware of this protocol and that's the point of getting it back out mm -hmm. in front of you. You guys go to the next slide. So I would like to take this time here just to find out um, if there are any further questions or if we need to create more shared understanding about this process and how it applies to you as health centers, uh, maybe to new entities that are looking at becoming health centers um, and then to OPCA in our role. The other thing I would say is that a lot of you ask us for letters of support, mm. whether it's from you know a, a funding opportunity or you're doing a, a change in scope at the federal level, not your PPS change in scope at the state level, but when you're adding a new site or new services, you gotta go through a change in scope process um, with the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. And in those situations, it's always good to have a letter of support from your uh, primary care association um, and particularly the federal government knows we've got a process. In fact, this process has been copied or slightly tweaked in a lot of other states over the years. Um, and so it means something to the application process. And all I can say is when we get those requests, we always ask the same question. Have you talked to the other the health centers in your service area? And we, and we trust but verify. We call the other health centers and say, you know, what was your opinion on this? Um, and if they're in agreement, then it's a really easy letter of support, obviously. Um, if you hadn't called them, but they're fine with you expanding anyway, then it's an easy letter of support. Um, if they weren't in support of you expanding, then that doesn't become a viable letter of support from us. And we send you through this protocol um, before we provide you with one. Uh, and in the instance where you run all the way through it and you agree to disagree, we can provide a letter of support and we point to the process that there was a good faith effort and here was the results of it. Um, and that shows, you know, it answers questions at the federal government level um, that there was a process that was, was tried. Now, obviously, if there's no, if there's agreement to disagree, then, you know, you're going to have to make a pretty strong case to the federal government that there isn't a overlap or sustainability issues uh, with the other health center. You guys working on? I've come up before. That's oh, okay. Um, are there specific questions that you have about what we've shared? I have a question. So, okay. what you, what the end product would be more than just a letter of support from the other agency or the organization. We would really need to uh, um, uh, put this process down on paper, how we came together, what we decided, what our sustainability are, the other things we agreed yeah. to. Okay. It actually, going through the process would probably make your your application stronger just because you're taking a deeper dive into some of the stuff. You're having somebody who is a facilitator look at the data um, instead of just you saying, here's the data I found, therefore there's need. So it, it actually, if you go through the process, it makes your application stronger. Thank you. Great. Um, and and one point of clarity too is that um, here at OPCA we can connect you to any clinic if you don't know them or know the executive director um, or are not totally sure who might be in a service area 
that you are looking at expanding to, um, we can definitely connect you with the right folks so that you are aware of who you need to be connecting with in the FQHC community. The, the other thing I would advise is where suspicions have cropped up in the past is if you're talking to the community and you're talking about an expansion opportunity and the other executive director from the other clinic hears it from the community. And then they're kind of like, well, I wonder what you're up to. And, you know, whether it's nefarious or not, it's just it's that that's why we always say contact the other executive director first mm -hmm. um, and you know, and go from there. Uh, and if you need to bring us in, that's fine. If you want even to contact us and say, I'm thinking, I mean, uh, I, I know that's been done recently, which is great. An executive director came to me and said, I'm thinking a couple years down the road, I may expand. I mean, perfect. You know, contacted us early. We talked them through the process, told them about, you know, which clinics are in their service area, so they had to contact. And so, you know, they were on it early. The wrong time to do it is after you've bought property or you've made a financial commitment or the timeline is so short that you can't even run through the process. And so think about this because for those of you tracking the bouncing ball, the Bureau of Primary Healthcare has allocated $600 million in addition to your base grant, right, through the, um, through the fiscal cliff fix which means there's going to be some growth opportunities coming out. Um, when, I don't know. We'll find more out about that as we go into the P&I. Um, but there will be opportunities coming up. So if you're thinking about the process, um, you got to get on it quick to go through these steps um, so you're ready uh, when, there's, when there's the expansion opportunities that are made public. Because usually they don't give you a ton of time to respond. Was it three to Three months or so, a couple. Yeah, it's usually just about three, yeah. three or four months. Yeah. Um, and so I, Claire, here at OPCA, I am our community development lead. So I am here to talk with you about any of this process or just the process of doing new access point applications, um, and just talking through any of sort of the growth plans you have. I do try to keep track of clinics that are thinking about expansion just so I sort of have a running list of who's looking at this um, and can share any relevant information such as when there are grant opportunities available um, or other things that may come up that might affect it and then I know to reach out to you because I know that you're you're considering doing some development in your area um, and the same goes for clinics that are interested that are not currently FQHCs um, I am the first person to kind of reach out and talk with them a little bit about the process and then make sure that they know that they need to connect with the other FQHCs if they're in an area with other FQHCs. Um, and then I keep them updated if new access point opportunities come out. So if you do become aware of other groups in your community that are looking at the FQHC model, please do refer them to me to talk them through the process that we have at our state level as well. I think that is most of what we want to cover today. So I'm just wondering if there are any last questions or um, any comments on this competition protocol. What's All right, well, not hearing any further questions from you, then um, we will wrap up this webinar. Uh, we do appreciate you taking some time out of your day to become a little more familiar with the topic. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to contact us about this protocol or any kind of community development uh, in general. My contact information is here, and I'm also happy to take any kind of emailed questions you may have after this um, as you realize you had a question that wasn't answered. Um, so I believe that brings us to the end of our time together. And I will. Is there just somebody trying to. Yeah, I don't know. Is someone trying to call in or talk right now? Might have just hit unmute. I just unmuted. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So we're going to go ahead and let you guys go back to your regularly scheduled Fridays. Uh, we hope you have a good weekend and we'll be in touch. Thank you.